Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that lovely warm welcome and introduction. Very humbling, actually. But uh, as Alexandra said, I, I was uh, convicted of terrible crimes uh, almost 32 years ago. I deserved my life imprisonment. You know, I, I, I've, I've never tried to make any excuses. Uh, they took me from the Old Bailey number one court under heavy escort to Wandsworth Prison, where I was locked in a cell for 23 hours a day, sometimes 23 and a half hours. And um, I, I, I'd been stopped in my tracks and my, my, my dysfunctional and uh, chaotic life, damaging life, I'd been stopped in my tracks. And for the first time in my life, I started to think about how I'd become what I'd become. I spent long, long days and long nights in that prison cell. I was locked in one with, in that cell for my first year of my life imprisonment. Just a bucket a, for my toilet, a bed, a table, and a chair. And um, I started to think about how I'd become what I'd become. In prison, you live in, in your head, and you have the most vivid, incredible dreams, daydreams and sleep dreams and nightmares. But uh, I thought back to my earliest beginnings to try and untangle my life journey. And I look back to when I was a child, and I'd, I'd been a happy kid when I was a little boy. I was an inveterate smiler. I had a mop of curly hair and my, a cowboy suit that my mother used to have to wait until I was in bed asleep before she could take it off me. And um, there was no clues then that I would ever be someone who would grow up to become the harm-causing individual that I became. When I was seven years old, my mother was killed in a car crash. And it, it changed the course of our lives. She was killed instantly. The driver of the van that she was in was killed. And my father was in the crash as well, and he was also injured badly. He recovered, but he was a very damaged man. He, he became a very violent, selfish, grieving, drunk. And he inflicted a lot of his misery on people around him. He took up relationships with other ladies usually who had families already. And me and my little sister, she was just one years old, we tagged along with these, these other families. And the years passed, it was, very, it was a very dysfunctional existence. My dad's violence became more intense and eventually it was directed at me. By the time I was 10 years old, I'd had enough, so I left home, basically. I, I used to live in a little air raid shelter. It was my den at first, but I moved into it permanently. I used to sneak out at night and steal apples and rhubarb from gardens to sort of keep myself alive. And then I committed my first crime. I broke into a sweet shop, a grocer's shop. I was picked up by the cops. And um, I remember, funnily enough, when you're a child, you have, you, you're, you're a great absorber of things around you. And when I was in the police car, the cops picked me up. And I was crying because I was sure my dad was going to give me the beating of a lifetime. And I, said, I was crying. I said, please don't tell my dad he'll kill me. My dad will kill me. I was crying my eyes out. And the policeman turned to me and said, you deserve to be killed, young man. That's how bad I was. I deserved to be killed. And eventually I went into the care system, and the good thing about that place was they fed us, they clothed us, and they sent us to school for the first time. As long as I could remember, regular schooling happened. And for some reason or other, we weren't educated, my family were never educated, but I was good at English. I was always the first to get my hand up in English class. And uh, in spelling lessons, I was supposed to get my hand up. And Mrs. Earnshaw was my English teacher. And it was the only time I felt really good about myself was when Mrs. Earnshaw gave me my grades and my report card. I always got a grade A for composition or comprehension and spelling. All the other teachers wrote negative things about me in my report card. I was a sullen child, they said. I had a chip on both shoulders. I had to learn to control my temper. I was an odd little kid, in fact. But uh, being good at English came to nothing, really. Uh, I, I basically left the home when I was 15 years old. I went back to have another go at living with my, my daddy. He now lived with another family in Western Supermare, which sounded great to me. Western Supermare, glamorous place. And they packed me off from the care home with a travel warrant, little travel bag, a couple of shirts, and some clean socks. And that was the end of my childhood. I basically. I remember when the chap took me from the home down to the railway station. He said, remember, he said, Leeds, Bristol, Western Supermare. So I had to drill that into my head and not get lost on the way. 
Well, I got down to Western Superman. Basically, it was pretty much the same sort of thing was going on. My dad's violence was the same. His drunkenness was the same. I stuck out for a while, and eventually I left home again, and I drifted for the next few years. I sort of slept, slept rough. I slept in garages. I slept in motorway service station garages. I slept in graveyards and outhouses. I slept with some uh, extended family members that had moved down from Scotland. And I occasionally had a bed sit. I committed more crimes. I worked on building sites. I worked tarmacking roads. I worked in factories, but I committed more crimes. By then, for me, it was no big deal to get drunk, have a fight, steal a car. In relationships, I became a bit like my dad. And I didn't want to be like that. This is the truth of it. You know, people think about criminals, and they, they have an idea of how people become criminals. I used to, when I was living on the streets, I used to look at people who lived in nice houses and had regular existences and think, how do you get to live like that? How do you get to live in a nice house like that? How do you become part of a community? You know, I was desperate to cross that road and become a part of what I could see around me. But I didn't know how to make that journey. My dysfunctions and, and uh, chaos continued, became more intense. My drunkenness, my violence. The years passed. I was in and out of police stations, drunk tanks, young offender prisons. And eventually I met my co-accused, the man who would become my co-accused. We lived in a squat in London. We were both pretty grubby individuals. We were the sort of people that you read about in newspapers, sort of people that you don't really want to know, you don't want to come across. And we, uh, we were both failed human beings, really. We bolstered each other's inadequacies. I was sort of big and had a bit of presence, he thought. He was small and scrawny. He used to have a few, he always had a scam going on in his life. He had money to buy drink, I drank. And between us, we started committing relatively petty crimes. And then one night, he jumped on a man in the street, a total stranger. I joined in this fight, what I thought was a fight. It turned into a mugging. And three months later, uh, our criminality had left two people dead. It never gets easy for me to say that. I wish I could tell you that I ran to the nearest police station to hand myself in. I, I didn't. I fled the country and joined the French Foreign Legion. I didn't go for adventure or excitement. I went to hide from my crimes. I didn't know what to expect, but I found a regular existence, something that get, made me some control, some discipline in my life that I'd never had before. And I actually enjoyed the experience, but I knew I was hiding and running. And eventually my father, my co-accused, was arrested and uh, told him it was all me and it was him. He made me do it. My dad then was arrested. The police were looking for me. They found in his house photographs of me in my Foreign Legion uniform. And then I handed myself in. I was on the run for almost two years. I came back to prison. I uh, came back to Brixton prison. I was extradited formally. And... Um, convicted the Old Bailey, and rightly so. If the death penalty on the statute books when I was convicted, I would have got that, and I wouldn't have minded at the time. You know, I was really, I was finished. I was really relieved, actually, that my life had come to an end. It had been such a painful life. I'd caused so much pain for other people. I had no wish to live again. I didn't think I was ever going to live again. Wandsworth Prison gave me time to think. After a year, they sent me to my first long-term high-security prison. And it was there I met a psychologist called Joan Branton, who her job was to assess my dangerousness. On my wing, there were 80, more than 80 men serving life imprisonment for all sorts of terrible crimes. There were terrorists, there were serial killers, there were child abductors. There were all, all the, you know, the, the, the lowest of the low. We were a grim club, and there was barely a spoon of hope between us. But this lady's job was to assess our risk. And during the course of 18 months of speaking to this woman, she persuaded me eventually I had some value, or I might have some value. And she said to me, you've got to get an education. I said, Joan, I'm too thick for education. She said, nobody's thick. She remonstrated with me, you know, we're all born lovable, she said. We're all born with potential. I said, well, even me, <laughs> even you, even you. 
And so to appease her cajoling, I joined the evening class and joined the English class. Sure enough, I was still good at English, and so in a short time I was top of the class. It's not that hard to be top of the class in prison these days. But I, I joined other classes, passed exams. I passed my first O-level exam, couldn't wait to get back to see Joan and show I was 30 years old, I couldn't wait to get back to her office to show my O-level grade A certificate in English. She said, I told you, she was unfazed. She said, we all have potential. We're all born lovable. I joined other classes, passed more exams. It wasn't all education and fun and games, you know. People outside think that there are rules in a prison, and there are. In the governor's office, there's a big book that says prison rules. But on a prison landing, in a prison hierarchy, there are no rules. It's a very primitive existence. You have to learn to sort of manage that. In 1919, there was a major riot in Long Larton Prison. The barricades went up. My next door neighbor was in for killing five people. He, he said, let's kill the nonces, the sex offenders. Let's burn the nonces. I said, Mick, let's not do that tonight. Try to keep some calm in the place. The IRA prisoners eventually calmed the place. He, Mick, hanged himself six months after that riot. During my course of my 20 years in prison, 1,247 people took their own lives in jail. So I knew it was a struggle in there. But I focused on books, education. I had some ability to survive the landings. I had no expectations or ambitions or aspirations to be rehabilitated, to be a writer. I became known in prison as the man that could write a good letter. That gave me a, at last, I had a position in my community. I had a place in my community. I was the guy that could write a good letter. And that was enough for me. I stopped my education for a little while because I, didn't, I was starting to feel good about myself for the first time in my life, and I didn't like that. You know, that was too much to feel good about myself. And then Joan, the psychologist, came to my cell and she said, what are you doing? I said, I don't deserve this. Passing exams and writing, being the writer in the prison and having this, this good existence in a high security prison. She said, you owe it to your victims, she said, to do the best you can with the life that you've got left. And that spurred me on to keep doing the best I could do. And so I continued to educate myself. I continued writing. I started writing groups. And eventually, after 15 years, the Guardian newspaper invited me to write a regular column for them about <coughs> prison life. And so I could, you see, I could have crawled in a hole in prison and rotted. Lots of people do. Lots of life prisoners, they give up. Year after year after year of living under the shadow of the opprobrium of society. The worst of the worst in there, you know, it's very hard to be motivated to actually want to live. But I just, I wanted to do the best I could. When I got that chance, I decided to grasp it. It was one moment in my life where I could actually prove that had things been different, maybe I could have been a writer, could have been a journalist, a Guardian columnist. Never saw that coming. And I started writing this column for the paper called A Life Inside. And it attracted a following. And I went from being the writer, the prisoner who could write, to being a writer in prison. And I was like a, a secret journalist on a long-term assignment on the wings and landings of our prisons. And I felt, I felt good about that. It was the best I could do. They released me after 20 years, not because I was a Guardian journalist or a Guardian columnist, because they said I was rehabilitated. But it was Joan Branton who made me feel I might have some value, that psychologist, who persuaded me to, to dig in, to do the best I could with the life I have left. She persuaded me that I might be redeemable. And so I was really released after 20 years. I walked out, I used to live sometimes and think, if I could just live long enough to experience one sunny day in there, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. You know, and I walked out of prison after 20 years on the sunniest August day you can imagine. Blue skies, beating sun, the big gate opened. The prison officer, I walked out, the prison officer called me back, said, come back. I didn't want to go back. He said, come back, come back. He had a little pay packet thing in his hand. I said, what's that? Your discharge grant. I said, no, I, I'm fine. I made some money for my writing. Most of it went to charity. But the last year I was in, I was allowed to keep the money I earned for my writing. So I had money in the bank. I said, no, thanks, I'm fine. No, no, he said, you must have a discharge grant. I said, oh, okay. So I signed for it, and I, I thought, 20 years, a few bob in here, and I looked in there, 46 pounds. And it's still 46 pounds today, 10 years later. 
And I thought, thank God I developed some skills and some abilities in there that would allow me to make a living, to live the best way I can outside. Thank goodness, because prison experience, if you make it, you make it by chance, not by design. So I wrote my book, Redeemable. And I've dedicated it to John Branton, the psychologist. And someone said to me a few years ago in The Guardian, oh, what makes a good writer? I thought, why is he asking me? I seem to be just getting away with it, you know. He said, what makes a good writer? I thought, I was trying to think of something erudite, something really interesting, something really motivational to say, and I couldn't think of anything. And then I remembered, what makes a good writer is a good editor. That's what makes a good writer. So thank you for your amazing observations, your utter commitment to my book, and for your compassion, your understanding, and your superb professionalism. Thank you, Alexander Pringle, and thank you, Bloomsbury, and I hope this book does well for all of you. Thank you very much.